Genesis. I'm going to be in Genesis chapter 1 today. <clears throat> and uh, Genesis chapter 1, the title, title of the message is really easy. The title is 6 or 7. 6 or 7. And a question mark. 6 or 7. Genesis 1. We'll start there. <clears throat> and I'm going to start at verse 26. So it is Genesis 1. If you haven't found it by now, just leave your Bible open where it is and act like you found it. And so you, so you don't look bad. And uh, it's the first chapter of the Bible. And uh, <clears throat> Genesis 1 and verse 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image. By the way, God, singular, let us, plural, that's because we have a trinity. That's because the, the word Elohim here is a plural word. Um, for a singular person, it's shown the Trinity. That's why it's translated properly. Let, and God said, let us make man in our image uh, and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the, er, all, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Uh, so God, God created man in his own image. After the image of God created him, male and female created he them. So God made man special. He made the animal separate. He made man in his image. Um, there's a lot to that. A, a lot of things. We're a three-part creature like God. God is saying that let us make man in our image. We have a body, soul, and spirit. Um, we, are, we are specially made. Um, humans are special creatures. Um, they're different from the rest of creation and the rest of nature. We aren't just part of a, a random evolution that got to the top of the thing. We are made differently with a soul that's different. And in the image of God, we have... Um, <clears throat> dominion been given dominion that God gave us as God has and uh, and God so God has made us differently um, over his creation uh, verse uh, 28 and God blessed them and God said unto them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over all the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth and God said by the way not the message but um, man was, and this is just, just when man was created, first of all, just man and women, women come along uh, soon after this. But understand, man was given to have dominion. Uh, that means they're supposed to overcome things. The land, the, the, the conquering, where you plant it and you make the land, bring forth the fruit you want, and you plant trees. It, it, animals don't plant and, and figure out how to overcome the drought and everything else and, and all those things. And that's part of what God made man to do is to overcome and to have dominion over things and, 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 and be strong. And I want to say this, and it's an emergency in our society because we've attacked masculinity and manhood and everything else that it, we, we can't even do this now with young people. But <clears throat> you are supposed to, as men, overcome things. And women, as they came along, were told that also. Okay? You will never be right and fulfilling and proper and, and what you're made to be unless you learn how to conquer things. It's the way God made you to be. And you're going to face things you don't know how to do. You're going to face things you say, I don't get how to do that. And you're going to find out that when you conquer things and overcome them and figure it out, just like somewhere along the way, somebody said, I got to get the water up here. I'm going to have to stop this creek. I'm going to have to dam the creek up. And I'm gonna, how do I do that? I don't know. You, maybe I try rocks. Maybe I try logs. And you fail and you try it. You, you find out that's your made to do. The problem is, is we everything is so easy and microwave and pills and everything just is so instant that when, you, when somebody comes up against something, they say, it's hard. I can't do it. No, you can do it. It's just hard. And you've got to learn to overcome things. Everything. You have to overcome. You have to overcome things in your marriage. You have to come over things in, in, in your career. You have to overcome things in people that, that oppose you. And you will find fulfillment in conquering what you don't know how to do, what you're too weak to do, what that seems a uh, 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 thing. You're made to do that, man. And young people and teenagers and stuff like that, understand, I'm going, when you're around me, I'm going to push you. I'll say, <laughs> they talked about, uh, Ron said, uh, I had to go speak four times. <laughs> he didn't even bother to, he knows better than asking, Pastor, I can't do this. You don't even ask me that. Don't even tell me that. 
uh, I'm going to, I'm going to make it. And, and, and I went to, I, I said, look, Ron, I told the pastor, I said, Ron, Ron likes to go witnessing more than likes to preach. And he says, well, I kind of didn't speak. I said, okay, he'll speak. Ron, guess where you're going to speak? Four days in a row. He was dreading the one time at the speak. Uh, uh, look, yeah, I, I, took my, I took my kids. When Tiffany was learning how to drive, she was timid in how to drive. And one night we pulled up on the side of the road. We're, we're on a rest stop. It's a terrible Washington rainy night. Those rainy nights when everything reflects and shines. And I said, all right, your turn to drive. And we're, we're coming to I-5 of a rest area down there near Centralia somewhere. And there's trucks everywhere. And you know how they splash the water and you can't see everything. And I said, all right, you drive. And boy, it was hard driving. And you know how you, but after that, after about 15 minutes, that's just, Dad, I can drive anywhere now. Yeah, well, don't have to worry about it. Now you know how to drive. And, and, and you know what? I just think we baby people too much. People can conquer things. People can conquer things. And when your little boy says, you say, go clean your room. It's too hard. Okay, I'll do it for you. You are ruining that boy. And he's going to be 18 and say, Mom, it's hard to get a job. There's nobody. Uh, they won't hire me. And you're going to be taking care of him at 50 because you never taught him to be a man. And conquer things and overcome and be strong. Okay? It's part of life. It's what God made us to do. Have dominion. Nothing to do with the message. Just <laughs> figure. That was free. That was bonus material. And uh, <clears throat> in verse uh, 28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea. Amen. Let's just go fishing. And over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, and upon the face of the earth, and every tree, and uh, which is the fruit of the yielding seed to you, it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every moving thing that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And thus the, the heavens were, and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them, and on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he had, uh, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance to learn about six and seven in your word. You emphasize these things, and I pray you'd help us today and speak to our hearts. And thank you for the Bible, and thank you for the truth that it gives us. Thank you. It has answers for today. And as it's for our lives, help us to make the right choice of you and not humanism and you and your way and, and, and trusting you and following you. And I pray you speak in a mighty way through the word of God. Thank you for the Bible and all the truth it gives us. May we search the spirit, search the deep things of God today as we study in Jesus name. Amen. God made man on the sixth day and uh, then he made the seventh day for rest. <clears throat> And that's all notable. It's all part of an important thing. The seventh day was for God. And the seventh day, God didn't make anything. He rested and was refreshed. And he blessed the seventh day, it says in verse 3. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it that he had rested from all the work which God uh, God created and made. The, God had made something different. Uh, he made the sun and the stars on one day, and he made the, the light in one day, and he made the plant life on another day, and he made the animals on a different day. And, and every day he made something. And on the sixth day, he went and he made mankind. On the sixth day, on purpose, because God does everything on purpose. He finished that. He made man, told them what they were supposed to do, and he said, okay, now we're going to take a seventh day. We're going to make the seventh day. We're going to make a thing called a week. And the week's going to have seven days, and the seventh day is going to be a day of rest. And I'm going to bless that day. It's going to be special. And it's going to be a separated day because it's my day for me and to rest and, 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 and to look back in the creation and see what we did. And, and my, my thing is seven. And man's is six. And God created man on the sixth day. <clears throat> six in the Bible represents man and man's incompleteness. 
We'll follow that all throughout the Bible. Numbers in the Bible, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes you'll find a number over and over repeated about something. And we find the number six is a very important number in the Bible. And it always represents man. It always has to do with man and who man is and what man can do. And their incompleteness. And they're, they're, they're higher than everything else. They're, they're next to God's number, number seven. They're, they're up at number six. They're above all the other creation parts. They are the, 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 the greatest thing God created. They're, they're above the plant life. They have dominion over it and uh, over the seas and over all those things. But they're not quite there at number seven. They're made different. And number six is very, is very common, and it always deals with man. Man was made on the sixth day. Man is to work six days. Man is supposed to have six years of harvest, and on the seventh year, he rests the land because... It's exhausted, and man's exhausted, and because man's limited. And they can work six days, but if they work seventh, they'll eventually be exhausted and drained, and it's not good for them. And God says, I'm going to make a seventh day, because man can't quite do all that, and the land can't quite handle it. The, 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 the world is kind of incomplete and isn't perfect, and so if you exhaust your land and you exhaust the, 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 the soil, the crops won't grow properly. And so you have six days of, of, of growing crops, and the seventh year, let everything just fall on the ground and let the land be replenished. And, uh, and that's what you're supposed to do. In the Bible, there's six cities of refuge for men who make mistake. And uh, when they accidentally kill somebody, they can run to the city of refuge so nobody will get revenge on them. And, and because there's no good process, because somebody's going to be angry because you accidentally killed their relative, and they'll kill you. So you go to the city of refuge, and there's six of those in Israel. <clears throat> It's an incomplete situation where it's not perfect and the world's not perfect. There's six major earthquakes in the Bible showing a fallen world and the world is not perfect. The Hebrew slave was to be kept for six years but released on the seventh and he'd be able to go free and, and, and rest. But the six years is the labor and the work where they are put in that situation and they're, they're, it's not fair, and it's hard, and things aren't complete. Jesus was six times accused of being demonic <clears throat> because mankind cannot always see God properly, and they don't always understand what God is like, and they look at him without really seeing the nature of God, and they think, how can he do these things? And, and I disagree with him, so he must be demonic. And man has a limited vision and a limited ability to see who God is. Six times the Pharisees asked Jesus for a sign. <clears throat> and Jesus said, I'm not able to give the sign. Uh, I give you the sign, I'll be re risen from the dead. But they were limited and they wanted things that man wants because man couldn't see that he was the son of God. And he was doing miracles every day and healing the blind and healing the lame and, and healing the lepers and, and changing lives. And, but they just said, no, we need a sign. And he said, the only sign you're going to get is, I'll be raised from the dead. And you're not going to believe that anyway, because man was missing it. And this number six always get them. In the end times, back in Revelation, we're going to have what's called the mark of the beast. And in Revelation chapter 13, we're going all the way from Genesis to Revelation. <clears throat> we find the number six coming very importantly into play. The, the, there's a man called the Antichrist, and he becomes a world leader. And everybody takes a mark on their hand. By the way, I have an article I just printed, uh, printed this week. Um, they are now doing the purchasing with the microchips. One of the Norwegian countries, I think it was Sweden, they're, they are, they're, they're, just, they're, they're down to, I think, 3% of transactions are in cash. And now they got the implant in the right hand, just like the Bible foretold. And they're now just buying it flat out with that. They're just doing that right now. And uh, by the way, it's eliminated in the bank robbery. It's a, there's no cash around. It's eliminated a bunch of crimes. And the world's going to go for this. And it's, it's fulfilled prophecy, and they're doing it right now. Now they're making the transactions. We saw a little bit of it here and there. Now it's now a nation's doing that. They're implanting chips in the right hand, and they're making the mass transactions. Most of the transactions are beginning to be done that way in that country. <clears throat> of course, we see this prophesied. We know the Bible always comes true in every prophecy. Though they laugh at it, it always comes true. Never a single miss. And uh, we see this in Revelation. This Antichrist will make everybody take a mark, either in your right hand or on your forehead, and it's going to be a number. And uh, <clears throat> in verse uh, 16, it says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, uh, uh, free and bond, to receive the mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man can buy or sell, uh, save he had the mark, 
or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is the here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for the number for it is the number of a man, and this number is six hundred three score and six. <clears throat> I'm not preaching the mark of the beast today, but probably the reason there's three sixes is because there's three parts of the world system. There's a political, there's an economic, uh, and uh, and there's a social part of this uh, uh, program. And you got to have all, all, all three there. You're you're, you're going to have this the total world system. It has to do with uh, whether you can buy or sell or trade, and uh, but all three of them are part of a man, the Antichrist. And this man is saying, I'm I'm like God. I am. Man exalted six six six, just like there's a Trinity and God has three parts. I am I am the ultimate man who's going to rule the world. Nothing can stop me, and you're going to worship me. And I rule the politics, and I rule the the economics of the world. And you're going to have to take my number or my name or the mark on you because it's the number of a man, <clears throat> six hundred sixty six, and it is man's number in the Bible, the number of man. Different than that, we see the number seven. In the Bible, there's 860 references to the number seven. And the number seven in the Bible is God's completeness. Seven times in the book of Genesis, we see God created. God made a week to count time, seven days in a week. And the last day, God sanctified because God's number is the number seven. God rested on the seventh day. There are seven colors in the rainbow and the total spectrum there. There are seven colors. There are seven notes in a musical scale. You go play that, you play the, the, the A, it goes with an A, even if it's on a different scale, because there's only seven notes. You can go all the way across the piano, and you can do an A or whatever the, the note is, or a D, and it's the same note and plays together because there's only seven notes. And that's complete, just like the seven colors. There's seven holy days in the Bible. The Bible is broken up into seven divisions. Uh, 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 the law and, and, and the prophets and the gospels and so forth. And, and you see that. Jesus performed seven miracles on the Sabbath day. The seventh day. <clears throat> seven on the seven. And he did those miracles to show that the, he is completing. <clears throat> and he is the Sabbath of our rest. In Revelation chapter 7, there are seven churches, there are seven angels, there are seven seals, there are seven plagues, there are seven thunders, there are seven last plagues, and there are seven trumpets. There are seven sets of seven in the book of Revelation, the book that closes everything out. Because God's number in the Bible is seven. And it's a sign of completeness. You have the whole scale. I remember hearing a story about a, 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 a guys who lived on, on campus at, and uh, they had a music department and the professor, <clears throat> one of the professors who taught music, lived up above, up above in a dorm, up above um, the, one of the music rooms. And they would go out and, uh, and they, would, they would play a joke and, and they would go out at nighttime and they'd go to the piano and they'd go, go through and they'd play a scale. They'd go, dun, 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 but they wouldn't play the seventh note. And do it again. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Then they run and hide. Five minutes later, here comes the, the, the professor, and he go down there. Dun, dun. He played a seventh note because it drove him crazy. He could not play because it's not complete. And they do it again the next night. And, uh, and, and why? Because it, it's, it's a complete thing. It's all the way done. Seven is complete. The week is done. The, 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 the scale is done. The, 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 uh, the rainbow is done. <clears throat> it, it, it's God's complete number. And man's number is not complete. Because man is not complete without God. Man is an incomplete creature, an imperfect creature. They can't always have everything. They don't do everything. They, there's, there's a lack of things. Man without God is a mess. The world and all of its history and a long history with things written from every part of the world. If you look back at history and you look at the history of the world, you find that man trying to rule themselves. You have, I think, 39 years of world peace in the history of the world. Because man can't figure it out. And man is incomplete. And man is 
in need of God. Man is a creation of God and, 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 and needs God. They are not perfect. God is perfect. God has everything. Do you want six or do you want seven? Man's proud attempts or God's perfect completion? Because your whole entire life, the devil is going to push you towards six. Because the devil loves six. It's his number. It's man's number. And it's incomplete. And without God, you'll never be right. You'll always be at a kilter. You'll try your best efforts. You'll try to do your very best things. But never will you get it all together. Never will you be able to complete yourself. Because six is not a complete number. And that's where God's made man's number. And that's when he made man was in the sixth day. The golden candlestick had six branches on it. <clears throat> but it was a seven-part candlestick because the center of it that went up also became a branch, but it was part of the, the whole, the whole um, stand representing God and representing he is the vine and we are the branches. And the thing's not complete and cannot stand by itself. And the branches by themselves don't mean anything. But he's, he is the branch that holds everything up and then has all those things. God's rainbow has seven colors. The gay pride rainbow has six. Do you know that? And the people who designed it had no idea. But there's a reason it has six. Why would you make a rainbow if you're trying to make a rainbow? Why would you not make all seven? Because it's man and man's morality. And he's rejecting God's completeness in God's way. And saying, we don't need God. We have our own way. We have our own morality. It's good what we do. Because man always is drawn and Satan pushes people to go and go towards six. <clears throat> the devil, in his deceit, tries to make us try to become like God. Let's go back to Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, he tries to make the six think that six is complete. And the six can become seven. <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 3, what does the devil do? He says, you can be equal with God. In verse 4, it says, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God hath known the day that ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the, the tree was good for food and it, it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise and to look, on, uh, and, and she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband and uh, with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. <clears throat> the devil came and said, you know what? You'll be like God. You'll be like seven even though you're six. Just eat the fruit. God says, no, that's not going to make you seven. You'll be a fallen six. Because I made you on the sixth day, and I made you wonderful, and I made you great, and you're going to be messed up now, and it's going to be, the whole creation is going to be messed up, and it's not going to be good. The devil always tries to get you to take God's place, to rule your own life, to live independent of God, to think that you have it all together. And then you find out you don't have know everything you think you know. If I got a dime for every time I thought I, I knew everything, boy, I was so smart when I was 18, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> and then life came along and said, oh, you don't know everything. Couple, you know, it's done that a few times. How many of you thought you knew everything at one point in your life? You were ready to conquer life, and boy, they just need to let you loose on life. How many of you thought you were like that? Okay. And you kind of learned some things. And you realize, you know what? Maybe, maybe my mom and dad knew something I didn't know. Maybe, maybe you know what? I need some advice. Maybe life's a little, life's a little trickier than I thought. My wife and I will never have an argument. Oh, okay. And yeah, there you go. We'll get along perfectly. I'll, I'll show you, mom and dad, how it is. Yeah. And then you find out, you know what? I'm not as perfect as I thought I was. I'm not as smart as I thought I was. And, 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 and you find that out, that even in the best condition, you still need something else. It's called God to complete you. 
And he knows you're weak. He knows our fa failures. He loves us. He wants to help us. And he wants you to be drawn towards seven. That's why he says, be therefore perfect. Even your Father in heaven is perfect. But the only way to that is through him helping you and then going into heaven someday and getting uh, redeemed. <clears throat> There's a few thoughts here I want to give you on this. Number one, man is incomplete to save himself. Let me take you to Hebrews, and I'm going to read just some verses there. You don't have to turn there, but Hebrews. Man is incomplete to save himself. That's Man is a six. You can't save yourself. But the devil is going to say, you can get to heaven by being good. You can live a good enough life. You are complete. You're good enough. No, no, no. You without God, you can't complete. You're not complete. A week is not complete in six days. A rainbow is not complete with six colors. You are not complete to save yourself and get yourself to heaven. Religion says, no, we can save you. No, religion is built up by men, and men are sixes, not sevens. And a religion can't save you, and this church can't save you, and I can't save you, and you can't save you because you're incomplete. Only God can save you. But he wants to save you, and he can save you completely. He can take away all your sins. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4, and verse 4, it says, And he spake a certain place to the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Now, what God's going to say here, he said, Look, I made the Sabbath as a representation of a rest for your soul when you go into salvation and you quit working. On the Sabbath day, the seventh day, you no longer work, you rest. And God says, That is salvation. It is a rest, not a work. Um, let's see, verse 4, And he spake a certain day, the seventh day, on this wise, that God did rest uh, on the seventh day from all of his works, and the place, and, and this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore a minute that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached, enter not in because of unbelief. <clears throat> and, and, uh, and then it says uh, uh, in verse uh, 8, it says, For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he have not afterward have spoken of another day. There remained therefore a rest to the people of God, for they, for he that has entered into his rest has also ceased from his own works as God did from his. So important here. <clears throat> I'm going to heaven 100% sure today not because I'm so good, not because I'm trying really hard and I'm, I'm stopping this and I'm doing this and I'm praying and I'm not doing this and not because... I'm going to heaven not because I'm doing this. I'm going to heaven because I'm doing this. I'm resting. The Bible says you enter into God's rest, you cease from your own works. I can't save myself. I don't try. I rest. Christ, you died for my sins. You're my Savior. I trust you. Save me. But what do you do? Nothing. I rest. I trust him. I told a story before, but <clears throat> a lifeguard told me one time that he says it's very easy to save somebody if they'll stop trying to save themselves. You can swim out to them. You put your arm around them. You swim to shore. They just lay there and float. Very easy. The problem is you can't get them to rest. They fight, they climb, they try to stand on you, they grab you, they attack you. They're trying to save themselves. It's, and you have to actually fight them some. Just to hit them and, and beat them until they'll stop resisting and fighting and let them rest. Because it's really easy. As soon as they just relax, you can save them. And as soon as you quit trying to save yourself and quit trying to let religion save you and enter into his rest, you quit being a six trying to save himself and let the seven, who's complete, save you and take you into his rest, you know you're going to heaven because you rested in Christ because he did the work on the cross. And I'm going to heaven today because Jesus Christ is my Savior and I'm resting in Christ. He died for all my sins, was buried and rose again, and I know I can't save myself, and I'm on the seventh day, not the sixth day. I'm not in man's salvation. I'm in God's salvation. And anybody can do that. Jesus already paid the price. Jesus already died for your sins and rose again. Please rest in Christ. Instead of laboring to get yourself to heaven, you'll never find rest for your soul. Because you'll never get where you're perfect and you're good enough to get to heaven. That's why Jesus died, because none of us are good enough. Number one, man is incapable to save himself. Number two, <clears throat> six cannot become seven. You can't become God. 
<laughs> Eve tried it, and she died. Adam tried it, and he died. I'm going to read to you. Just understand this. Just understand this, folks. There's one God. There will never be another God. You're not God. I'm not God. We're a very small creature on a big planet that God made by just speaking it into existence. Isaiah 45 in verse 5. Let's read you some verses here because we're not God. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God, God beside me. <clears throat> I, girded, I, I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. That they may know from the rising of the sun, from the west, that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Verse 21. Tell ye, and bring ye near, and take counsel together, who hath declared it from ancient time, who hath said it uh, from that time, have then I the Lord, that there is no God beside me, a just God and a Savior? There is none beside me. There is only one God. Chapter 46 and verse 9. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none beside me. Evolution, by its very nature, says man is the highest achievement of nature. And we evolved into mankind, and mankind doesn't need God anymore. We did this without God. It's all nature, and they worship the creature more than the creator. I want to say that, first of all, it's not true. Secondly, we are not as high as we think we are. We're fallen creatures. They do terrible things sometimes, and that are weak, and that are frail, and they don't know everything. And when you stop saying, I know, I, I can do this, I, and you start saying, you know what, I've done my best, God, but I can't do this. I don't know how to do it. I need your help. And you start praying. You start needing God. You know, you realize you aren't God. Because a lot of people start thinking they're God. I got this. I can do it all. I don't need anybody. I don't need God. I can, I got it all figured out. You'll never be God. You're going to die. You don't know everything. You're limited in knowledge. You get sick. You get weak. You get discouraged. You have bad days. You're human. And that's okay. As long as you don't try to make yourself think you're God. When you say, I'll do what I want to do. Oh, it's my life. Who's God to tell me how to live? You're making yourself God, and you're a very bad God. And I'm a very bad God. I'm a very frail God. I'm a very limited in my knowledge God. Why would I try to be God? You're a six. God's seven. Let him be God in your life. Let him rule your life. Let him guide you. Follow the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. And, and let him be God. Let him lead your life. Let him rule. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He's going to rule anyway. <clears throat> you can just be wise enough to let him rule your life and take you where he has planned for you because he's God. Don't try to be a number seven. Pharaoh tried it. He says, who is a lord that I should obey him? And soon he was underneath the waters of the Red Sea. Nebuchadnezzar was tried. He tried that. He said, I have made this kingdom. This kingdom I built by my power, by my strength. And God said, I'm going to humble you. You're just a man. I gave you this kingdom. You would not be born in that family if it weren't for me. You would not be breathing if it weren't for me. And he made him a beast of the field and crawl around for seven years until he knew that the Most High ruled in the kingdom of men and gave it to whomsoever he will and brought him down from his I'm God complex. I did this all to, you know what? I've been given a lot of stuff. <clears throat> One of the things we find so commonly when you take someone on a missions trip is they come back much more humble and realizing I could have been born in that country. I could have been born in those circumstances. I could have been born in that village. <clears throat> And that, that person right there is just as precious as me and just as wonderful as me and has a brain and a body and arms and legs just like me, yet they're in the middle of a village pumping a well every day and carrying water on their head for a mile to go back. And they're, 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 their life's different than mine. It's not because you're so brilliant that you are born in America or because you've been given privileges. God blessed you. 
And God blesses them and gives them grace that, they, that they're, they're happier than us a lot of times. But understand that everything you have is not just because of you. You didn't make your air get breathing. You, you, you didn't make the weather in America so we can grow such great crops. So we have so much food and we have so many wonderful things. We see Lucifer tried this. He tried to become God. <clears throat> Here in Isaiah 14, he's thought, I'm going to become God's position. Isaiah 14, 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. I'll be God. No, no, Lucifer, you're not. You're a powerful archangel. You're greater than anything else God's created. You are greater than mankind. You're greater than the rest of the angels. But you're nowhere near God. See ya. <clears throat> and God himself won't even have to take care of Lucifer. He said, Michael, take care. I made somebody more powerful than you, Lucifer. Chill. You're not God. But we're arrogant. We try to become. Become that. We are not the moral authority. God is. Our morals can be skewed. I'm amazed you know, the, how morality has changed in America from when I was a kid. Because morality can change. Everybody thinks that what their morality is right now is the, is the enlightened morality. They don't understand. If the TV starts saying something else is different, then it's going to change. And your morality will follow society in most cases. If you, were born in, if you were born in Saudi Arabia, you might think it's good to beat your wife, and you might think it's good to blow yourself up in a kindergarten. Because man's morality is very frail. And smart people think dumb things. A bunch of smart Germans thought it was a good thing to kill Jews. Because... The morality of humans is not that great, and it can be skewed a whole bunch. God's morality never changes. Barack Obama was against gay marriage, so he wasn't. Same as Hillary Clinton. You remember that? 2008? The majority of Americans were against that, and now they're not. Why? Because morality has changed. Human morality is a frail thing, and can be changed by programming that people hear all the time. That's just the society we live in. Right now... <clears throat> It might seem bad to have slavery, but human morality has said before it's the right thing. I mean, there's a bunch of morality changes all the time. By what country, by what's programming you're hearing, by what society says. But we are not the, that's why we don't trust ourselves to always know what's right or wrong. Because when you're, when, you're, when you're angry and furious, it seems perfectly right to go key your boss's car. But it's not right even when you're mad. No matter who your boss is. It seems right to ram the guy who cuts you off on the highway. Sometimes. But we're not a moral authority. And don't think you are. Realize you're incomplete. You can get messed up. You can convince yourself all kinds of dumb things. You ever done something you thought that was okay to do? And then later on you said, what, what, are they, what was I thinking? Yeah, we all do that. Romans 3.10 talks about man. It says, and as it's written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that are sent. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Don't think you have perfect morality. You always know it's right or wrong. And what you feel in your heart is always right or wrong. No, it's not always right or wrong. We're talking about Six cannot become seven. You cannot decide what's right and wrong. God says what's right and wrong. Number two, you do not know anything compared to God. <clears throat> Isaiah 55. You don't know anything compared to God. We think we're so smart. We get so arrogant. It's an amazing thing. Your kid gets arrogant at two years old. Johnny, you cannot eat that. You, will go, you, it's, you cannot eat all that sugar. I'll be fine. I am not tired. Yes, you are tired. No, I'm not. Your kid at two years old thinks... He knows more than you. And he's not even a teenager yet. Wait till he gets to be a teenager. His IQ goes up by 100 points when he, between 12 and 13. It's amazing. <clears throat> Humans are so arrogant in what they know. There's so much we don't know. You don't know what's going to happen in five minutes. There could be a meteor headed toward this building right now. 
It's a cheery thought, huh? And, and <clears throat> you got it all figured out. No, there could be a drunk driver crossing the road on your way home. There's so much we don't know. We don't know why bad stuff happens. We don't know why that happened. We don't, there's so much we don't know. And it, uh, humans are so arrogant. They think they know everything until they realize, I'm not as smart as I thought I was. Isaiah 55, verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. Verse 9 is a memory verse. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Next, <clears throat> Do not be ruined by, because of that, but not be ruined by man's philosophy. Because men are not as smart as they think they are. They talk big, but there's a lot they don't know. But if you follow the Bible and follow God's word, you'll find it's always right. Trends of men come and go, but the Bible always works. It always works. Just base your life on the word of God. <clears throat> Colossians 2.8, Beware lest any men spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. After the root of the world and not after Christ, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Man is incomplete to save himself. Number two, six cannot become seven. Number three, without God, man is, will always be incomplete. You are made to need God. John 15. <clears throat> I could sit up here and tell you my accomplishments and my travels and what I know and my degrees and everything else that I have. And I can sit here and say how wonderful I am, but I want to tell you, I, uh, you, though some people might think I'm pretty competent, I want you to understand something. Without God, I'm nothing. I'll mess everything up. If I try to run this church in my own strength, it's going to be a wreck. If I try to run my family in my own strength, I'm going to ruin it all. The only reason, the only reason I haven't ruined my whole family is not because I'm so smart. Look, I am bred to have divorce and ruin kids. I grew up with every possible disadvantage in my life and every possible thing to have a terrible life. But I decided, you know what? I don't know how to raise kids. I don't know how to be married. I never saw a good marriage in my life. <clears throat> I come from divorce. <clears throat> I come from drugs. I come from alcohol. <clears throat> I better find out what God says about marriage because I don't know what I'm doing. That's why I've had 28 years of very happy marriage. And I married better than I am, because smart enough to marry up. Because the Bible says to do that in Proverbs 31. Her price is far above rubies. And, and, and you know, anything I've done right is because I said, you know what's the Bible say about that? And I did it. Then we said, man, you're so smart. I said, well, yeah, but <laughs> I'm smart enough to follow God's word, because I'm not that bright. I know without God I'm incomplete. I know God made me to need him. I know my soul will always thirsts without him. John 15, I am the vine, you the branches. I am the vine, you, my father is husband. Every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, and may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean to the words which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except that it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. <clears throat> man is on the sixth day, but the seventh day is really important. It is there for rest. It was there for completeness. A sixth day week would be a disaster, and it would not be good. And God said, I made seven days. I'm there on the seventh. You'll need me also. I will give you the rest you need. You'll find your life without God as an exhausting labor with no rest for your soul. You'll find yourself stuck in the first six and trying and trying and doing your best in life. Why isn't this working? Why am I so tired? Why isn't anything going right? Why can't I get anything done right? Why is it? Why did, every time I think I got it together, it's, something else slips? Why is this? Why? Because you're on one through six. And you're not complete without God. You need God in your life. You need him to help you, to give you the strength you need, to give you the wisdom you need, to rest your soul, or you'll be exhausted. You being exhausted is not a matter of the amount of hours you work. You will find a person who is unemployed and laying around in their apartment all day, completely exhausted in their soul. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and you shall find rest for your souls. Because without God, you're not complete. And you are the hamster running the wheel. Last of all, <clears throat> last of all, seven beats six. Seven beats six. 
turn to Revelation 13. We find the Antichrist coming and gaining power in the world, and he will. <clears throat> but we can be patient because we know seven is greater than six. The alligator's mouth points toward the six, not the seven. <coughs> Revelation chapter 13, we find that the Antichrist is taking charge, and the whole world says, man, nobody can stop him. And if it says in Revelation 13, 4, it says, and I saw one of the... Uh, one of his heads is as if it were wounded unto death, and the deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered at the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, that's Satan, which gave power unto the beast, the Antichrist. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war against him? Boy, it looks like the Antichrist has ruled the world. He is mortally wounded in the head, and somehow he's alive, and Satan's given him supernatural powers, and miracles are being done. The whole world is under his economic system. Nobody can stop him. Oh, no, no. He's six. He's a man. And he's not seven. Revelation, and we see in chapter 19 what happens. Verse 19, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, the one that nobody could end, stop, and their armies gathered together to make war against him and sat on the horse and against his army. The world at Armageddon gathers together with all their weapons and the Antichrist and the rulers and say, we're going to destroy God. God comes down on a white horse and the beast was taken, verse 20, it's not much of a battle, with his false prophet that wrought miracles before him, in which he deceived them, he received the mark of the beast, and with him and worshipped his image. These both were cast alive in a lake of fire, burning the brimstone. And they were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. Those two were immediately thrown into hell. It's basically, okay, open the door. Rule the world. Hey, guy. You. Slam. Satan. Michael, go grab Satan. Open the door again. Throw Satan in. All right. We're new world. It's not a back and forth. It's not exchanging of blows. God is omnipotent. Satan is not his opposite. He's not omnipotent. He's not. Satan's a limited creature in one place with limited power. All the power is given to him by God that he has. And it's not a battle. And God could just say, here, disappear. And he disappeared because God's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. And there's sin. Though the world maybe seems like and the sixes seem like they're winning, they're not going to win. Read the end of the book. Okay? Seven wins. God wins. And I'm just glad I'm on the right side. And if you're not lining your life up with God, let me tell you, you're missing out. You're living in six in a messed up world of exhaustion and work and labor. And, and, and it's seven's waiting for you. But you can't save yourself. you got to come to Jesus. What do you want? Do you want humanism, the world and its system? Or do you want God? <clears throat> the devil's going to push you to be God of your own life. God says, you know what? I'm God. What do you want? What do you want? Six or seven. The world's screaming for six. Man has all the solution. Man has the answers. God says, come to me and I'll give you rest. Come to me. I'm going to rule the world forever. You'll have heaven forever. But it's a restful place. Follow me. What do you want, six or seven? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance to preach your word today. I pray we understand that there is, these numbers are different. And six represents man's incompleteness, and seven represents your completeness. And I pray today that we would rest in you, that you bless the seventh day, because it represented you and your completeness, the complete rainbow, the complete uh, musical uh, scale. Lord, the complete week. Thank you. And our completion, and we are complete in you, as you said in Colossians. And I pray to find our completeness in you. I pray today, first of all, if someone isn't saved, they'd be saved. I pray if they are saved, that they would let you rule their life and not try to do it themselves and find rest for their souls. Lord, thank you for your word that shows us these things, and thank you that you win in the end. Lord, seven's a really good number. Thank you for it. Thank you for showing us these things all throughout the Bible. And thank you we can trust you because you're smarter than us. You're, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are your ways and your thoughts higher than our thoughts. We thank you for that. And then we can just look to you and rest. We pray in Jesus' name.